Is it working though? They are joining back. I don't have Heather. There she is. Are we ready to start? I think we could start if uh, you agree and have a short uh, time to, uh, for presentations. Uh, and so we give an extra time for people to join us. We have so far 13 participants. So we have a good group. And um, if, you are, if you all agree, I can start it. Yeah. So, Good morning to everyone and welcome to this technical discussion on the renewal of the essential public health functions in the Americas and in specifically in the Caribbean. Uh, I'm going to open up with um, short introductions uh, from everyone and I will start how I see it in my screen. So the first one is Dr. Peter, Peter Adams uh, from UWE, please uh, Dr. Adams. Yes, um, I am. Peter Adams, I am Dean, the Faculty of Medical Sciences at Cave Hill. I'm currently the University Medical Dean because we have four um, sites where we teach um, medicine, um, Mona in Jamaica, St. Augustine and Nassau. Um, and um, I've been working with, with Dr. Puertas and, and Jesse for quite a while and we, we have, um, with collaborations in the making. Thank you very much, Dr. Adams. Uh, we'll continue with uh, Dr. Ernesto Bascolo. Please, Ernesto. <clears throat> Thank you, Benjamin Puertas. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, to be in this, in this opportunity. I am, I am Ernesto Bascolo, and I am a regional assessor of governance and health policy uh, from HSS department. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll continue with Dr. James Fitzgerald. Yeah, good morning, uh, everyone. My name is James, James Fitzgerald. I'm the Director of Health Systems of Services at the Pan American Health Organization in Washington, DC. It's a pleasure to be with you all this morning. Uh, Ms. Jessie Chaudanet. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Jesse Shutane. I am the coordinator for the sub-regional program uh, for the Caribbean based in Barbados in Pajo. Good to have you with us this morning. You, we have Ms. Natalie Houghton. Hello, everyone. My name is Natalia Houghton, and I'm a monitoring and evaluation specialist uh, for Pajo at the Health Systems and Services Department based in Washington, D.C. Happy to be here. Thank you. We will continue with Dr. Heather Herwood. Good morning, everyone. I'm Heather Herwood. I am the head of the public health group at the UWA Faculty of Medical Sciences at, in Barbados. I'm also the coordinator of the MPH program. And like Dean Adams, a happy collaborator with um, Benjamin and Jesse on a number of initiatives. And I'm very happy to be here this morning. Thank you very much, Dr. Herwood. Uh, Continue with uh, Dr. Amalia del Riego. Uh, 
Uh, good morning. Um, I think I signed in with the same link that uh, Ernesto Vascolo signed, so you will see my name as Dr. Ernesto Vascolo, but I am uh, Dr. Amalia del Riego and the unit chief for the Health Services and Access Unit in the Department of Health Systems and Services. And um, I have a long history of work in the Caribbean, so I'm very happy to be with you today uh, in this meeting. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you, Amalia, and I'm glad that you were not trying to confuse the moderator. <laughs> um, I'm going to open the microphone for the colleagues who are also um, here. So I will start with uh, Gabriel Gonzalez Escobar. If, uh, if you can introduce yourself, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm Gabriel Gonzalez Escobar, head of the Laboratory Services and Networks and CARFA. And today I'm representing our Executive Director, Dr. Joyce and John. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Escobar. Uh, we'll continue with um, Dr. Masha Ivy. Please introduce yourself. Masha Ivy, can you hear us? Hello, good morning. Um, Marsha Ivy from the UWI based in St. Augustine. Thank you very much. Uh, we continue with uh, Dr. Oscar Ocho. Oscar, if you can introduce yourself. Hi, good morning. Um, Oscar Noel Ocho, Director, Senior Lecturer, UE School of Nursing, St. Augustine. Thank you, Oscar. Uh, Patricia Sheratan is not. Please introduce yourself. Hello, uh, good morning, all. I am uh, Patricia Sheratan Besnoth, the CEO of the Caribbean Family Planning Affiliation. Very good to be joining you in this webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, Sir Trevor Hazel, uh, please uh, return. Oh, I'm, hello, I'm uh, Trevor Hassel, and uh, I'm president of the Healthy Caribbean uh, Coalition. Uh, I have been working with Jesse and uh, the Bajo team uh, based here in Barbados for many, many years. Uh, happy to be here. Unfortunately, uh, I need to leave at 1030, but it's just in a few moments, to attend the Bajo uh, TAG SALT meeting. So my apologies. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hazel. Uh, so when uh, we'll start uh, with uh, today's discussion and the first um, item in the agenda is renewal of essential public health functions. I'm sorry, introduction and uh, the essential public health functions initiative in the Caribbean region. And uh, uh, Ms. Desi Shudane, she is the Caribbean Subregional Program Coordinator. Uh, microphone to you. Hey, good morning. Um, and thanks, thanks for joining uh, the call this morning. Um, I recognize that there are quite a few um, clashes unexpected, I think, at the heads of government meeting yesterday. Um, they called for an emergency CMO meeting today. Um, so that could be why some of the participants um, are not able to join. Um, but we will have an opportunity to um, you know, share what comes out of this meeting so that everybody is up to speed. Um, so thanks, um, you know, we're, we're pleased that you could, you could be with us today. Um, in this meeting, you know, we have a range of public health experts from around uh, the region um, to discuss the renewed framework and present the revised essential public health functions document. Um, as you all know, the essential public health functions were initially a response to a weakening public health system. And it's an initiative that started in the early 1980s and took hold in the Americas and many countries adopted and adapted the instrument to their local conditions. And as we move um, towards achievement of universal health within the context of recurring um, health emergencies, AHO is uh, looking to renew the focus on the importance of essential public health functions in the Americas. Um, 
Many of you would recall that um, the PAHO strategic plan 2020-2025 was approved by the PAHO directing council last year. In the Bahamas, uh, with the co-chair of the member state technical working group that was uh, that was tasked for um, you know, doing consultations with the member states around the strategic plan, and there was extensive and broad um, consultations with member states. And in those discussions, um, one of the objectives was to that we know that it was included was to strengthen the capacity of countries to perform essential public health functions. And that was identified as one of the top priorities um, over the next five years in the strategic plan. And updating the approach to the essential public health function stems from a need for a more holistic vision of public health to address some of the recent challenges that we've been facing. Um, as we're all aware, um, the emergence of infectious disease represents a growing threat. Just within the span of 10 years, um, we've had major health events, including H1N1 in 2009, chikungunya 2013, Zika 2015, and then Ebola, which didn't affect the Caribbean directly, but still we were, uh, there was preparation for that as well. And now COVID, um, which started in 2019. And all these events have challenged the health system's ability to respond and to ensure access to health interventions. There's also the political, the social, and the economic determinants of health and challenges around health equity um, that have traditionally been outside the scope of public health action. And we know that that needs to be integral to public health action. In the Caribbean, we have an aging population and we have socioeconomic conditions that have led to increases in non-communicable diseases, mental health, and disabilities. So these health problems require intersectoral approaches, and they also require innovative responses. The conceptual framework for the essential public health functions has been revised to support countries in strengthening capacity to carry out public health actions and to implement policy to strengthen health systems and intersectoral interventions. Um, the framework promotes a new approach for public health actors to better integrate the central public health functions across the health systems. Um, it offers an opportunity to help catalyze political commitment and support needed to ensure universal health access, global health security, and greater health equity in the Americas. The technical discussions with partners in the Caribbean is an important step to advance with the renewal of the essential public health functions in the region. Um, today we'll have a presentation from James Fitzgerald, who's the Director of Health Systems and Services, as he already introduced himself, and also we'll hear from Dean Peter Adams, the Dean from the Faculty of Medical Sciences, and Dr. Heather Harewood, um, who's the Coordinator of Public Health Program at UWE. And they'll kick off the discussions and reflections on how the essential public health functions uh, work in the Caribbean. Early next year, uh, we'll carry out pilots in some Caribbean countries um, where the assessment tool will be applied, and later the rest of the Caribbean countries will hopefully um, apply the assessment tool as well. Um, also, this, a strategy and plan of action on the essential public health functions will be presented at the PAHO Directing Council in 2021 next year, and PAHO will be carrying out consultations early next year towards that. But with this, um, again, I want to thank you for, for being with us today. I know that everybody has busy schedules. Um, I look forward to your engagement and your discussions and your feedback. Um, thanks a lot. Now I pass over to, um, to James. Thank you very much, Jesse. So following the agenda, we'll continue with uh, Dr. James uh, Fitzgerald. He is our um, director from the Health Systems and Services Department in uh, Bajo, Washington, D.C. office. And uh, we have Peggy De Silva that just joined us. I'm sorry? We have another person that just joined, Peggy De Silva from the chief. Oh, person. yeah, yes. Uh, let's take advantage to, before uh, James' presentation, let me open up the microphone to her. Uh, good morning, uh, Ms. Peggy. Can you introduce yourself? Is 
Is Peggy Da Silva, can you hear us? Yes, please. Good morning. I can hear you clearly. Yes, uh, we're asking you to introduce uh, yourself. Uh, we are just starting. Oh, I'm very sorry. The volume was done. Yes. Good morning. My name is Peggy De Silva. I'm the Chief Nursing Officer for St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the Chairman of the Regional Nursing Body. Thank you very much and, and welcome. So we we'll proceed. You. We'll proceed with the presentation, Renewal of Essential Public Health Functions in the Americas by, by Dr. James uh, Fitzgerald. The microphone over to you, James. Uh, let me open up the, and share the presentation with everyone. Uh, let me know just and confirm if, uh, if you can see it. Nothing yet. Yes, yeah, we can see it. Uh, Benjamin, perhaps you can put it on full screen so that, um, sure. yeah. Is that good? That's perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, so very good morning to you all. Thank you, Mekamin. Um, Thanks very much, Jesse. It's wonderful to have this opportunity to provide a, a little bit of a technical briefing to you on, uh, on discussions around the renewal of the framework for the essential public health functions in the Americas. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this has been um, this has been a trying time, I think, for for everyone. I didn't want to to start this presentation without really putting this within within the context in which we find ourselves. Um, unfortunately, the the Americas continues to be the epicenter of the COVID nineteen pandemic, um, even as the situation becomes uh, um, worse in, in Europe. Um, we see many countries in the region still struggling to deal with um, the unprecedented uh, challenges in health, but not just in health, uh, also in the economic and social sectors uh, that are resulting from, from the pandemic. We've seen um, estimates from, from our colleagues in, in ECLAC indicate that uh, growth is, uh, GDP will essentially reduce from the order of 9 to 10% uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and, and what we're essentially looking at is potentially uh, 10 years of, of lost gains in health uh, as a consequence. This is directly either as a result of the pandemic or through uh, excess mortality and morbidity. Um, what we can say is coming out uh, as, as we transition through the pandemic is that COVID-19 has really uh, exposed uh, structural deficiencies and weaknesses within, within our health systems and with, within our social protection systems. But if we specifically look at uh, health, we see that health systems have been unfortunately underfinanced. Uh, they're segmented or fragmented, resulting in differential benefits depending on, um, depend, depending on issues such as uh, income and capacity to pay, um, uh, exacerbating inequities throughout, throughout the region. And COVID-19 has further exacerbated these inequities and in access um, to health. Um, one of the critical areas uh, is, is the lack of public investment in, in health systems and in health in general. And as a consequence, the lack of this investment has, has had to be made up uh, by individual, by households uh, that are now covering essentially one third of healthcare costs, uh, resulting in, in increases in direct out-of-pocket payments. COVID-19 is estimated to increase poverty levels um, by approximately 45 million people. Um, in, in the Americas, um, unfortunately. Um, there is, I think, a growing consensus around, around uh, what needs to be done. Um, we need to recenter health as a, as a driver for uh, development um, um, and as part of the recovery. We cannot open economies without uh, dealing with the pandemic. And so the principle of life, health and well-being are fundamental uh, and constitutes pre prerequisites for us to retake the, the road to, to, to health and a sustainable development agenda. And within this context, prioritizing public health and ensuring that our health systems have the uh, capacity to, to, to ensure universal access to health and universal health co um, coverage. Uh, these core elements constitute the, the necessary foundations for us to be able to retake that path. Next slide, please. And so it's within this context, um, that um, we begin to look at the linkages between what, what we have known are the essential public health functions and strategies, core strategies for health systems transformation uh, toward the achievement of universal health. Universal health, what we call universal health, um, 
is a strategy that was formally adopted by our member states in 2014 um, that really calls on, on all countries to ensure universal access to comprehensive, integrated quality care without incurring financial hardship. Um, it is based on the principles of, of the right to health, equity and solidarity and had four principal strategic lines of action. Uh, the first being to really uh, expand um, equitable access to health services based on primary health care um, and through integrated health care uh, delivery networks to increase financing, um, but with, uh, with equity, increasing pooling and reducing out-of-pocket expenditures, strengthening the stewardship um, and governance function um, of the state to, to really um, ensure that degree of equity as we move forward to, to, to universal health and to strengthen inter, intersexual coordination. And this strategy has really provided us with a very good framework to, to support health systems transformations uh, throughout the region of the Americas. Um, as its premise is really to, to advance in, in, in guaranteeing the right to health, um, core elements of it, as I mentioned, are stewardship and governance as driver of health sector reforms around these four lines of action. Uh, but within that element of stewardship and governments, we, we find that there has potentially been insufficient emphasis uh, around the issue of the essential public health functions um, that have to be central to the issue of, of stewardship and, and governance at the, at the national level. Uh, it's not an either or question in terms of individual um, health services, ensuring access and coverage at, at the individual level and then ignoring uh, the population uh, based services and, it, and indeed population health. Um, access and coverage can only be addressed if we address both. And so this, we, we, we see that this in itself will, will, will support the advancements towards um, realizing the right to health in the region. And so we, we see a cycle here. But core to this is retaking and embedding the essential public health functions within what we call universal access to health and universal health coverage. Next slide, please. Um, as Jesse mentioned in her in her opening remarks, the the essential health uh, the essential public health functions are are not new. Um, they date, in fact, back to um, the late 1990s, where the Institute of Medicine uh, launched uh, in the United States launched the launched the concept, uh, and thereafter it was, it was taken by the Pan American Health Organization in the early th 2000s, resulting in a, a specific public publication on health of the Americas and the essential public health functions. And, res and thereafter move towards the, the assessment of, of these functions within, within the region. Um, there was perhaps at that time insufficient emphasis on establishing the necessary linkages with policy development and embedding the essential public health functions within the institutional mechanisms that really re were required to, to make it effective. Over time, um, interest I think somewhat uh, dissipated in, in this issue. But as Jesse mentioned in her opening remarks, H1N1, uh, Zika, Ebola, uh, discussions at the global level around the responses in this, in this area resulted in, in heightened interest in, around 2016 in the essential public health functions. And at that time, PAHO began a, a process to, to begin to look historically uh, at what had been done, uh, what had functioned, what, what hadn't functioned uh, within, uh, within, this, uh, within this sphere and to look at some countries that have maintained um, actions in, in, in the essential pu in public health functions. We kind of regrouped internally, carried out some Delphi consultations um, and inter interdepartmental meetings and, and began to look at the possibilities jointly with public health experts, uh, with National Institutes for Health, um, with some uh, ministries of health that had extensive experience in this area and of course with a much broader range um, of technical departments within the organization to develop a renewed framework. Next slide, please. The renewed framework, therefore, um, is built on core values uh, and pillars that are well aligned with, um, with the strategic orientations of, of our member states and, and of PAHO governing bodies, in particular the PAHO strategic plan. Um, the right to health, equity and solidarity, which is transversal across our mandates, um, is, is at the center where we seek to improve access to health, health being perceived as, as not just individual um, diagnostic uh, and treatment services, but um, health prevention, health promotion, rehabilitation, palliative care, 
uh, and, and addressing health issues relating to um, the social determinants of health um, and in fact the environmental determinants of health. Core to this is, is what we've seen coming out of the discussions um, over the past couple of years is that this cannot happen unless we strengthen the stewardship role, the governance capacity at the national level to be able to inf influence policy agendas to, to realize um, this much broader perspective in terms of, of public health. Um, and linked with that is the question of access, access to individual health services, but ac access also to public health and population-based services. Breaking down this dichotomy of choice and, and siloed approach to both uh, um, individual care and population health services. Next slide, please. And so um, there was, through this process, um, uh, a look at, at some of the conceptual definitions around public health. Public health has been, um, within the previous iterations of the, the essential public health functions, has been defined as the field of knowledge and practice of collective action of the state, together with civil society, to protect and improve people's health and guarantee the right to health of the population. Um, this in itself is a very good uh, conceptual definition. But what was very clear when we went out to the Delphi consultation and discussions with our member states was that um, it lacked the processes to embed this in the institutional frameworks, policies, and actions that are required to make it effective in, in the countries. And so um, the experts to date have, have, have suggested to us that the, the, newer, the, the renewal process needs to really look at the issue of the essential public health functions as capacities of health authorities at all institutional levels, together obviously with other actors, civil society, uh, to strengthen health systems, health systems being taken within the much broader context of not just health care uh, services, but all actors and institutions participating in the improvement of health to ensure the full exercise of public health, acting on factors and bringing in aspects of the social determinants that affect population health. And you saw the, so you see here, there's a, a, a bigger focus on the issue around governance and stewardship, um, collective action around that, um, the, and then the social determinants and environmental determinants of health, which are, which are contained within. Next slide, please. And so based on this, um, the proposal was to really retake some of the original work done by the Institute of Medicine in the United States around the policy cycle and to update this, looking at some of the uh, more structured approaches in terms of governance and stewardship and the social determinants of health and the much broader intersectoral action that is required to ensure um, public health um, at the national, regional and global level. And the policy cycle is essentially based on four key elements. First of all, evaluation or assessment. Second of all, this, the, the process by which policy is developed. Thirdly, the allocation of resources and the definition of institutional mechanisms. To, to make effective that policy, and then the guarantees that are required to ensure uh, actual access. And then we move back into the evaluation process. And so it is around, these, uh, around the policy cycle that the, um, the, our, our experts have, have worked to, um, to reframe the essential public health functions, noting that this policy um, cycle is really a core function of governments um, to, in, in, in the exercise of the stewardship role that, that needs to be uh, executed and implemented effectively to, to, to protect and promote health. Next slide, please. And so if we look at that, if we look at this cycle, we, we can then um, look at some of the essential public health functions around some of the elements of, of that cycle. For example, in assessment, monitoring and evaluation um, of health and health conditions, not just uh, in terms of um, disease uh, surveillance and monitoring, which is important, but much more broadly in terms of analysis of the, of the, of the determinants of health, including uh, those related to health systems, but all those that also that are outside the health sector, um, including the social determinants. Uh, surveillance control and risk management, whereby we see um, very clearly in recent times the need for really heightening and making much more uh, sensitive are our surveillance mechanisms uh, and risk management processes to to avert um, to avert uh, uh, emergency health situations in the future. 
research and knowledge management is also a core part of, of the assessment process. And it's these three key pillars that constitute the assessment element of the policy cycle. In terms of policy development, the policies, the legislation and regulatory frameworks that embed the actions, the recommendations that are coming to improve access to health and universal health coverage uh, and improve the health and well-being of, uh, of the population. Part of this that has been critically identified as a, as essential public health function is effective social participation and the mobilization of all actors within society to participate not just in the policy development process but in the oversight mechanisms that are required to ensure its effective implementation. In the area of the allocation of resources within the policy cycle, uh, there are key resources that, that, that are fundamental um, and often we see lacking as I mentioned at the beginning, for example, if we take the issue of equitable and efficient health financing. But not just in health financing, in the access, distribution and quality of the health workforce, in the availability and the regulation enforcement of uh, uh, access to health technologies. Uh, key resources that are required in, in, um, uh, in ensuring the public health functions. And in the guarantees of, of access to, um, to structure and organize the, the healthcare delivery network that provides, uh, that is res ultimately responsible to uh, to ensure access to quality services um, and to link those uh, care delivery services with much broader population health-based services uh, at the same time to, to, to address some of the broader issues in population health. Um, the issue of health promotion to promote health and reduce risk factors and, and uh, address the issue of healthy behaviors and then looking at the social determinants of health. These are, these are so the, the, the essential public health functions that we have now embedded within the policy cycle. And these, these have been looked at extensively um, by, the, by the experts within the broader context of um, strengthening governance and the newer definition of essential public health functions. Um, next, uh, next slide. Um, I'm going to quickly go through each of each of these areas, but I really wanted to focus on the intersectoral approaches and the integrated approaches for each of these areas, right? Um, if we look at the assessment component of the policy cycle, um, core to this is not just looking at specific diseases uh, and their determinants, but looking at the social determinants and the causes of health problems. So it's a broader analysis that is required um, at national levels uh, in terms of the essential public health functions. And it includes aspects that, that, uh, that we often have not fully developed in terms of uh, health intelligence, uh, the predictive nature uh, to improve the predictive capacities within, um, within health so that we can potentially mitigate against future uh, public health emergencies and or trends um, that will result in a much over a much slower period of time. In, in poorer health outcomes. Associated with this then are the social determinants, but also the performance of health systems, um, evaluation and, and health economics. Next slide, please. We see also the intersectoral approach and integrated approaches in the policy development process, whereby um, the, the function speaks to the need in this area of improving the level of social inclusion and social protection policies um, in, in health. Uh, this is the, I suppose, the, the, the cross-sectoral nature of, uh, of health that has been made ex very evident by COVID-19, um, where the implementation of public health measures has, has resulted in situations where um, in informal economies where there is no social protection, people have had to really struggle to ensure uh, and put food on the table and to protect their families within this context. And so the linkages between health, social protection, the economy, labor, environment are very clearly um, um, made explicit within, within the policy cycle here. And the integrated approach really speaks to uh, the, the, the discussions around public health policies per se, and the provision of health services that address uh, individual, individual and population-based needs. Next, please. Continuing along this then, uh, uh, this approach, we see also the intersectoral approach and the integrated approaches in the area of the allocation of resources. If we just take the issue of human resources for health, for example, um, the dialogue that is necessary between education and health and labor. Um, if we look at the um, issues of medicines and technologies, the intersectoral action that is required between science, technology, um, health and industrial development. 
Um, this is, permeates throughout all of these areas uh, and is very key in the allocation of resources um, um, to ensure uh, the access that we required ultimately um, in, in, in their availability. Next slide, please. And then finally, in, the, in guaranteeing access, we also see the, the integration access approach. I'll, just, I'll take here, for example, the integrated approaches to ensure access uh, through individual, collective, and intersectoral interventions on the social determinants. Yeah. Um, with the intersectoral approaches, looking at uh, issues around, for example, models of care um, and inter interventions uh, to ensure, for example, water and sanitation. And so this is really important. I think the message here that we want to leave is that um, it's, it's both integrated in and intersectoral around a policy cycle that looks now at the essential public health functions, uh, strengthening um, governance and stewardship uh, for this purpose. Next slide. Um, so one of the big questions was, well, what do we do in terms of measurement and strengthening? In previous iterations of the essential public health function, functions, the focus was on measurement and strengthening. Um, and they have been somewhat, um, it has been somewhat uh, criticized for overemphasis in this area. Um, and I think in, in the new iteration of, of what we're looking at now is to say, yes, the process of measurement and strengthening are extremely important, but they are important for one sole purpose. And, 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 it's that, and that is for transformation, to take the information through the processes and really begin to uh, instigate change um, within, within public health so that action can be taken based on the, assess the assessments and outcomes um, that, are, um, that, that we will be generating. Um, and so we, we have developed this process by, by which we have uh, institutional mapping processes, capacity measurements uh, that Jesse mentioned, and then resulting in the, what we would like to be working with, with our member states on uh, developing national roadmaps to strengthen the essential public health functions um, based on based on the framework that we have now presented uh, here to you today. Finally, next slide, please. Finally, what are the what are the um, steps uh, forward? Well, we are at a stage now where we are looking at launching the renewed essential public health framework um, document process. We we find that it is extremely timely um, with where we are in terms of the pandemic. Uh, there is considerable interest globally, regionally, nationally um, in this issue. We'll be looking at um, implementation of validation case studies using the methodologies uh, for the assessment processes. Um, and we will be moving into a process uh, of formal consultations with our member states uh, in the Caribbean, in Latin America, in North America, um, around a strategy and plan of action for strengthening the, the essential public health functions based um, on, the technical, uh, on the technical guidance we've provided here today. Once we receive that, then we'll, we'll enter into a process of supporting member states, uh, national institutes, other sectors, civil society in, in its implementation. So I'm sorry I've probably taken a little bit too much time, but uh, I thought it was important to uh, provide you with that overview. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. James Fitzgerald. Um, I want to welcome Dr. Landis, who has joined us. Um, please, if you would uh, introduce yourself, Dr. Landis. Uh, yes, um, I don't seem to have uh, my audio functionality, but um, I'm the uh, Pro Vice Chancellor for Undergraduate Studies at the University of the West Indies, but maybe more importantly, I'm the chair of the COVID-19 uh, task force. Uh, really wonderful talk. I enjoyed, um, uh, I enjoyed it, uh, Dr. Fitzgerald. Thank you very much uh, and welcome again. So we're going to continue with our agenda and now we have uh, a presentation by um, Dr. Heather Herwood. She is the coordinator of public health programs at uh, the University of West Indies. And she's going to present uh, uh, the essential public health functions in the Caribbean, background and lessons uh, learned. So the microphone over to you, Dr. Herwood. Good morning. Thank you very much, Dr. Pretas. Good morning, everyone. So 
I'll just start with an overview of my presentation. I'll do a brief, very brief introduction or background to the Essential Public Health Functions Initiative in the Americas and look a bit more at the application of the Essential Public Health Functions within the Caribbean and how it has been used to help set agendas. And basically, I'm going to be looking at how we can map the Essential Public Health Functions to health, set, health systems agenda setting health system strengthening, and also the role in training the public health workforce, because several of the essential public health functions speak to these things specifically. And in closing, I'd be looking at some of the responses, some of the unmet needs that have been identified, and the next steps, which would lead us into the reason why we're all here today to discuss the renewal agenda. So just to give us a bit of background and context, to remind us that public health can be simply defined as the, sorry, what, apologies, what society does collectively to assure the conditions in which people can be healthy or have improved health. And we understand that this is a main function or responsibility of the health systems, which is, as was rightly said by Dr. Fitzgerald, is more than just health service or healthcare delivery, but it really speaks to the policy driven interaction of all the organizations, institutions, and resources that produce actions whose primary purpose is to improve health. And this sets the, you know, the, the ambit for the essential public health functions to be actioned and to be involved in, going to, in the activities to improve health or to assure health conditions. Health systems have a number of functions, financing, health service delivery, insurance, and steering. And health systems, because they're policy driven, because they involve multiple players, are dynamic systems or dynamics. And this is a very dynamic system, it's a complex system. And over time, there have been a number of reforms. And typically, reforms have focused on financing, on the structure of the health system, and even the organization of the health systems. But what was important about the Public Health in the Americas Initiative, which came into our region in 1999 and was ratified in 2000, is that the health sector reform actually put a greater focus on the stirring function of national health authorities as having that overriding moral obligation to assure the conditions that would improve health or preserve health, promote health, all of the things that we ascribe to public health actions. And this initiative, Public Health in the Americas, delineated the key functions and it affirmed the stewardship roles of national health authorities and identified that the essential public health functions was an important, vital part of any strategy of a national health authority. The essential public health functions have been described in several PAHO documents and I like this definition. It describes them as the indispensable set of actions and competencies under the primary responsibility of the state. So it recognizes that other actors are involved, but the, again, the steering role, the stewardship role of the state is emphasized. And these actions are described as fundamental for achieving the goal of public health, which is to improve, promote, protect, and restore the health of the population through collective action. So it's not just a ministry having a policy, but we look at the essential public health functions, things like social participation, you know, having or constituents involved in developing and delivering health and within our region the primary health care strategy really embodies what the essential public health functions can be when they're at their best but you know it's important to see where challenges are and we will explore some of those today as a launch pad for the renewal strategy so this diagram just demonstrates some of the roles of the national health authority and identifies that along with regulation and leadership the essential public health functions form an important cog in the dimensions of national health authorities. So I'm just presenting this slide with the 11 essential public health functions to remind us how they can be mapped to the health agenda. So example, if you look at the first essential public health function, monitoring, evaluation, and analysis of health status, you know, this is something that is done routinely by governments and it allows us to identify trends um, to see when um, we're having a potential outbreak, for example, dengue statistics. And it actually links very well with essential public health function number two, which involves public health surveillance, which can be routine surveillance, which can be sentinel surveillance. And again, these help to shape the actions that governments will undertake to help to promote health and to achieve improvements in health.
The essential public health functions do describe a spectrum of competencies and actions that are required to improve population health, but I think an important aspect of the rollout of the essential public health function was the self-assessment um, component. So it allowed countries to be able to monitor and evaluate how well they were doing in achieving the goals and the targets of the essential public health functions initiative. And this just allows us to see what the scoring is like. So um, persons were, were, would be able to identify if the performance of the country was minimum, below average, average, or optimal. And what I will present now is a summary of the self-assessment that was done by the Eastern Caribbean and the Netherlands Antilles, Antilles member states in 2001 and 2002. I've tried to use a bit of a traffic light um, overlay for this, didn't put in the green, but just to highlight areas that would be of concern, say to the regional level, at the Caribbean level, and then I will use Barbados as a specific case study for some of these activities. So we will note that there were some areas that we did reasonably well in, for example, reducing the impact of emergencies and disasters on health, and this might reflect our traditional focus on the hurricane season and those hydrometeorological impacts that we experience on a seasonal basis every year within the Caribbean. And there were some other areas that were reasonably well done, including surveillance and research. But we noticed that, for example, quality assured personal and population based services. So the quality of the services were of a concern when the self-assessment was done. And this was something that was echoed, not just at the regional level, but if we drill down a bit further, it was a problem in the Caribbean. And even though it might be in the Amber region, which is about average for Barbados, it still remained a concern relative to some of the other essential public health functions. Research in public health, again, an area that is you know, considered to be a, an area of concern. And I will go on to give a bit more of how Barbados drilled down into this when they were doing a, a further self-assessment and looking at how to employ, apply the results of this performance assessment to help set the health agenda, but also to strengthen the health systems. But the key point from this slide is that the essential public health functions provide a formal process to evaluate performance of the health sector and it allows priorities to be set and it allows um, you know, persons, to, countries, national health authorities to determine what is important for their development in terms of having the essential public health functions actioned and realized within countries. So there were a number of areas, global areas of concern for the Eastern Caribbean state, national health authorities. And what came out was that leadership uh, or the stewardship role was an area that was ripe for strengthening because this was one of the areas that performed poorly. And there was also recognized poor capacity to translate research into decision making. And if you recall the sort of scores that were obtained for essential public health function, which related to research, you know, this follows on. But research is important, but I think the translation of research to help guide decision making to drive policy so that everything is evidence-based is an area that was understood to be important by governments and identified as areas for action. And a few slides from now, I will demonstrate how some countries have put that into, into play. So the response strategy for the ministries of health um, were outlined in a performance review in 2007. And key areas included strengthening the NHA role to focus on essential public health functions to embed it into the health agenda and the strategies and also to strengthen the IHR or international health regulation functions and roles within government because we recognize that a lot of the threats which we're facing and it was outlined by Dr. Shutane this morning, Mrs. Shutane this morning, that a lot of our threats are globalized. So having a strong international health regulation base supports the role of the essential public health functions as well. Embedding the essential public health functions into the national strategic plans would allow a way of operationalizing what the intended targets are and allow a measure of measurement of performance again. And the targets were also developed to improve or to strengthen the institutions within the Ministry of Health or national health authorities. So using Barbados as a case study, in the document, the health systems profile of Barbados, which was um, produced in collaboration with PAHO, it was known that for essential public health function, 
number seven, which is the promotion of equitable access to needed health services, the score was 0.75, which is con considered to be in the higher range, the good range. And I just use this slide also to demonstrate that even with a self-assessment, you can recognize where you're doing well, but it also allows you to see where you can actually potentiate what you're doing well by identifying where gaps may yet arise. So the Ministry of Health was described as having the necessary institutional capacity in terms of the processes, the capacity and decentralized competency to ensure equitable access to needed health services. But what came out and what was identified as an area for further work and to address was the apparent lack of confidence in the public primary care services that was expressed by some of the users and that was identified as a barrier to access to care. And also, so there can be physical barriers, it can be tempor you know, barriers with respect to time or with, with respect to you know, the whole, whole, whole the health services set up. And with the respect to the lone tertiary center, the long waiting list for complex procedures was identified as a potential barrier which limited access to needed care. And these were areas that the government would have focused on thereafter. For essential public health function number 10, research and public health, the score was 0.24. And the Ministry of Health, Barbados, acknowledged that it lacked the institutional capacity or a formal agency which was charged with developing a public health research agenda. Yet, there were still some areas for hope because there were several long-term studies that were being commissioned at the time in 2000 and two that were ongoing. And one of them, which is um, a landmark study, is the Barbados A study, which actually commenced in 1994. And recognizing that there was the potential to have collaborations with other entities, so where a, a national health authority may not have the institutional capacity, the story that is coming out here is that they were able to find forged collaborations with the then Chronic Disease Research Center, now called the George Allen Chronic Disease Research Center, to do the Barbados Ice Study. And as we look further towards the applications, we will see how some of these collaborations have been strengthened over the years. So in summary, the essential public health functions performance assessment allows identification of areas where there are gaps or low performance, and it is, they're considered to, be, to signal opportunities for improvement. And the lessons that were learned were used to strengthen the health systems by identifying the areas of renewed focus within the stewardship role, enhance human resource capacity by identifying specific training and continuing education needs, and also the forging of the collaborations with key partners, such as the Chronic Disease Research Center. And the, the then government made um, efforts to inf um, inform the Barbados Strategic Plan for Health 2002 to 2012, the essential public health functions assessment findings were used to inform that strategic plan, identifying areas for key attention and to see how the low performing areas could be improved and how the well performing areas could be maintained. So if we want to map now the essential public health functions, applying the actual findings to practices that were then undertaken by government. If we look at essential public health function number eight, human resources development and training in public health. These it can be mapped onto what were then developed within the UWA system, where a number of diplomas and other programs were developed. So there was a diploma in health services management. The MPH program was actually um, develop in response to an identified need of not just the Ministry of Health Barbados, but ministries across the CARICOM region to enhance the leadership potential um, within public health, especially for people who are at the middle management level. Then within the nursing sphere, it was recognized that there was the opportunity to potentiate the training and then to develop persons who would be able to go on to do nursing administration, nursing education, and the DRPH program is a further example of where CARICOM recognizes a need to develop leadership skills and potential and to develop strengthened public health competencies within the workforce. So we can see where essential public health function number eight is being mapped onto the health agenda and the training agenda within the region. If we look at essential public health function number three, health promotion, within the Ministry of Health Barbados, for example, there was, there was development of a designated health promotion desk 
staffed by a senior health promotion officer and a health promotion officer. And this desk worked very closely with the um, desk for chronic disease management so that there was overlapping of the functions. And this was, again, an, in an effort to address what was identified to be a major problem within our setting, the high incidence and prevalence of the non-communicable diseases. And finally, if we look at essential public health number 10, research in public health, I alluded to it before, but I just want to really um, highlight the partnership of the UWA um, Chronic Disease Research Center, the Barbados National Registry in 2007. The registry was um, established and the Ministry of Health in the 2008-2009 budget actually allocated funds to undertake a study to look at the chronic disease impacts and profile within the country, the Health of the Nation study. And most recently, with the advent of COVID, there's been the ongoing collaboration between the Ministry of Health, the UWA Task Force, and the UWA Public Health Group located at Cape Phil, which is a collaboration with the Faculty of Medical Sciences and the George Arlene Chronic Disease Research Center, again, to undertake important research that was used to help guide the policy and the response to COVID-19 within the region. So this is a point to pause and think about the fitness of purpose of the essential public health functions at this juncture and to consider what will be the next steps. What has been emphasized in the previous um, discussions, the pre previous presentations, and at the start of this presentation, is that the importance of stewardship and governance needs to be retained. So any movement in terms of repurposing or you know, having a reorientation for the essential public health functions must have the stewardship and governance focus because it is understood. If we look at COVID, the responses within the region, if we compare countries, countries where stewardship and governance are stronger seem to have a better outcome with respect to managing COVID-19, for example. You also need to address the current and emerging challenges to the health system function. I spoke to the NCD burden in the region. And if we think of it from the perspective of the region, uh, you can see where, for example, the Court of Spain Declaration Evaluation was an example of where the essential public health functions could again be mapped onto this response. There was evidence of using, using research to gather important information, both quantitative and qualitative, so that you could just not just look at the numbers, but understand what were the drivers from the perspectives of both persons who are delivering healthcare, but also the persons who are expected to be the participants and users of the healthcare services and to interact with the health system. And this was a, you know, a good example of mapping essential public health functions. So yes, it is fit for purpose for those sorts of um, interventions. And again, if we look at the globalized threats, most currently being COVID-19, we can see again, if we map what was done in the Caribbean, where the interactions for research and development, social participation, so having other entities on board collaborating with the National Health Authority, so the UWA, for example, but other regional agencies were part of the collaboration so that a guided response could be given to COVID-19 within our region. So you can see where, for example, essential public health function four, social participation, essential public health function one, speaking about monitoring and evaluation, and certainly essential public health number 11, managing emergencies and disasters, where several of the functions were overlapping and complementing each other, and in terms of how it was being rolled out within the country and within the region, within COVID-19. However, there are still a number of areas of unmet need. And if you look at the persons who were most challenged with COVID-19, it is found that the extremes of age, persons who have comorbidities, persons who might live in depraved circumstances, there's still, there still that gradient where the burden of the impacts were higher on some um, sections of our societies. And you know, it, it speaks to what was said in the, in the previous presentation about assuring access and having the rights-based approach and equity and assuring that the, the basic human right to healthcare is achieved. So I think this is a good opportunity to focus on what may have been the successes of essential public health functions within the Caribbean, but also to identify what the gaps are 
to see them as opportunities and to, you know, to move on to what would be the repurposing or the reorientation of this essential public health functions initiative within the Americas. So I want to thank you for your attention and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Heather Herwood, for the very interesting presentation. So we have uh, completed this stage of uh, uh, reviewing what has been the proposal of renewal of uh, the essential public health functions in the Americas. And then we have seen, in particular, the Caribbean experience with the, uh, in the past and how they perceive the future. So uh, we have come to the... Um, uh, point where we can start the question and uh, answer session. So uh, I'm opening the microphones for everyone who would like to post a question or a comment. So please do so. You can also use the, the chat or you can uh, use the microphone. We have uh, uh, Dr. Oscar Ocho. So uh, go ahead, uh, Dr. Ocho. Thank you. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Uh, for this and for the presenters, very um, robust presentations. Um, but as I listened to our last presenter, is it Dr. Hollingsworth, if, I'm, if my memory says me right? Um, one of the, the concerns we've had um, coming from our center, Caribbean Center for Health Systems Research and Policy, is whether policymakers themselves have an understanding of what policy is and how they interpret evidence to support policy. And it's an area that we are having discussions on to look at a Caribbean piece of research among policymakers within the various ministries of health. As I listened to your presentation, was that something that you all explored um, when you look at the essential public health functions? Or is, do you see this as, as something that we need to look at, bearing in mind that very often evidence is not utilized to inform some of the policy decisions from the regional level? Over. Thank you for that question. Um, what well, I would say, I do agree with the concern about the translating of evidence into policy and into practice. So that was one of the things I had um, identified or noted rather from the assessment that that was identified as a weakness, that translation of research findings to guide decision making. And if you look at some of the more recent initiatives though within the region, and I refer to the cost eval evaluation, the Port of Spain declaration evaluation, this was an, a concerted effort really to get the research and to, and to engage with the policymakers, but also with the persons who, as I said, are the participants and also the recipients of the policy in the sense that you don't want it to be top down. Um, what was important though, I think what, what is often lacking is the fact that Sometimes the research is done is just quantitative, but what has come has been, a, uh, I think, a, a big focus for certainly the CDRC and public health group here at CAFL, and is the whole idea of matching the quantitative with qualitative evidence, understanding the how, the why, the what, the where, because it is often those areas where policies may seem to fail. And also, to, it is important for, I think, for the policymakers to understand it from the perspectives of the the, the same population that they're trying to serve. So I agree it can be strengthened. I think the way forward will include a lot more of mixed method and um, maybe community participatory approaches where you know all of the persons are involved and it is not so much of a top-down um, approach, but that the experiences, the perceptions, the, the, the understandings that people make from their realities can be brought to the policymakers as well. We have also a question from uh, Dr. Landis. So please, Dr. Landis, the microphone over to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, I enjoyed both the talks. Uh, of course, I know Heather, um, she's a colleague. Um, 
And I really wanted to uh, pick up on what Oscar had mentioned. Um, my experience has been that policymakers within the ministries will make good policy if they're given the information to do so. And I think in the, um, uh, in the cycle that Dr. Fitzgerald um, described, we often fall down in the very first segment, which is the assessment segment. And when you provide good information to policymakers, my experience in the Caribbean is that they will act on it. So as an example, we didn't really know how many strokes we had, how many heart attacks we had um, in uh, Barbados until we set up the BNR. Um, uh, uh, and when we did so, um, and we presented this information to the ministry, it underpinned policy decisions, for example, the creation of a stroke unit and, a, a, and an acute uh, intervention unit for, um, uh, for heart attacks. And, you know, and then we were able to continue to monitor 28-day survival after putting in those interventions. My experience is that policymakers will act on evidence when they're given it. Another example would be the the uh, dedicated HIV treatment unit. You know, we went pretty much from zero to hero in, in Barbados when we presented a health economic analysis of the fact that we would be saving more money by investing in having a dedicated treatment center for HIV rather than having people coming in extremely sick, close to death stores and uh, running up um, enormous expenses in our ICUs and emergency rooms. So again, you know, um, uh, and, and here again, uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the university and uh, CAFA have been, and PAHO have been giving quite a lot of good evidence to the policymakers. And I think we have by and large made good decisions. You know, our, our response for COVID-19, I would say has been characterized by being scientific and systematic. Um, so, so I think uh, we need to strengthen that uh, and, and focus very much on providing good data for our policy makers. Now, when you go through the Caribbean region, it's usually left off um, all of global analyses and you will get us lumped in with other big groups. So, you know, I quite often hear on the BBC, you know, that the Latin American Caribbean region is the new hotspot for coronavirus. And I, I really want to scream because uh, the Caribbean, you know, when you actually do an analysis and you sort of pick it apart, uh, we have far lower levels, um, even per, on a per capita basis, of cases and deaths than uh, Latin America. Um, but, but even when we do these kind of analyses and present them, we're struggling because a lot of the Caribbean territories don't uh, uh, collect their data and, um, and, and, and contribute it to uh, you know, these international databases. So comparisons become difficult. So, so my sense is that we should continue to strengthen uh, data collection and data usage. I think policymakers will use it. Um, and then of course, uh, there were a whole load of other fascinating um, ideas, which I back 100% from Dr. Fitzgerald on uh, the social determinants of disease. And the fact that many of our interventions and solutions and preventions are, are really, you know, not so much in the health sector domain, they're actually in the in the societal domain and so we have to involve the society in the solutions because the social determinants are really huge thank you very much uh, uh, i don't know if uh, heather or james would like to add anything no um benjamin no no really i i just want to really thank everyone for um for participating and and also for for those insightful co comments I, you know the issue of um evidence-based decision making in policy um we have we have gone through uh, ups and downs on this area in in global health and public health over the years um you know, COVID-19, if we look at what has happened um, in some countries, notwithstanding the good stories from, from the good evidence that was provided by Dr. Landis in, in the Caribbean, we have seen a shocking lack of application of evidence in policy decision making in some uh, countries in the Americas, uh, irrespective of whether it's the use of unproven therapeutics or the or proposals for um, 
in the use of um, Clorox disinfectants. It's, you know, we, we have seen everything. And, and what, one of the things that, you know, we've been thinking about a little bit is, okay, there is the evidence, there's the data, um, is how you present that data to a policymaker so that it really influences the agenda. And that's where I think the second story, the second part, which is, I think, um, becoming more and more important in, in public health is the, the communication part um, to tell the story, to make, to translate that evidence into a rationale that makes sense to a policymaker so that action will be taken. Um, and in a manner that is based on, on the evidence. Um, so yeah, we're living in a new context now within, within the context of public health, where it's not just science data decision, but we have to deal with uh, information, misinformation and disinformation, um, which, which makes our work uh, even more, uh, more difficult. Um, but this is all the more reason I think why we really need to strengthen um, the data science and, and information side of things and begin to be able to work uh, far more rigorously with our policymakers on some of these areas. Thank you, James. I have a question for the panelists and all the participants here. Uh, it says, what do you think is the potential of this essential public health function proposal to guide an agenda to strengthen the health sector? So for, I mean, from Paolo's perspective, uh, we will consider it one of the um, principal pillars moving forward. Um, you know, in what we are hearing um, and what we are seeing in terms of discussions coming from countries is that there is going to be, you know, obviously the strategies for health systems transformation for universal health and universal health coverage uh, have been core there is a, a growing shift in tendencies to begin to look at the issue of health security um, and resiliency within, within the health systems. And we believe that, as I presented in the presentation, the combination of an approach around the essential public health functions linked with strategies to strengthen the health system based on the strategy of universal health really addresses those, those two key areas. And this will come, become very clear as we move into the governing body cycle next year, Paul. Any other comment from uh, anyone? I have one more comment, uh, Chair. Um, so one thing that was quite interesting with the, uh, the Port of Spain declaration in 2008 was there was a sort of common um, understanding that we were facing a public health problem uh, with the NCDs and from the very highest level, the word was put out that we could um, present comparative data across the region. And so we have become used to seeing these kind of dashboards, uh, which CARFA and PAHO have been using, where countries are comparing um, themselves with other countries. And this is something relatively new. Um, and I think we can, we can use that uh, going forwards um, uh, so that we can, when we, um, we can leverage this kind of solidarity, if you want, and maybe propose having um, template uh, policies. So, you, you know, if you propose them to the leaders at a high, uh, uh, at a high level, maybe a follow-up of the Port of Spain and say, look, why don't we adopt best practice policies and, and, and have you know, template policies that, that the technocrats can work on instead of, I think, maybe just leaving it up to one policymaker at a time in, in a different country. So I think we have progressed on this sort of collective Caribbean action. Um, and I would maybe like to see that extended to the policy uh, circle. Thank you very much, Dr. Landis. I saw the hand of Dr. Escobar raised uh, and then it went back. So uh, I'm going to give you the, the microphone, uh, Dr. Escobar from CARFA, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, Chair. And thank you uh, to both presenters. Very, very comprehensive um, and very well structured and insightful presentations. I have two very brief comments, uh, one comment and, and one question. Number one, is that I, I totally agree with, with Dr. Landis with regards to the problematic fact of sharing data in the Caribbean. 
Uh, most of the times you will see that sharing data from countries to, these interna to the international databases and, and other systems uh, to register data is being interfered by, by many factors, uh, including the political factors. So uh, share of data in the, in the sub-region is actually uh, one of the most problematic uh, um, factors. And on the other hand, I have a very brief, rather than a question, is is a curiosity to for for Dr. Fitzgerald. Um, in in your last uh, slide, you you presented that there will be some validation uh, with case studies, and this include um, these studies include Chile, Costa Rica, and the Caribbean. I wonder if this is just um, random or, or because Chile is probably the most developed country in, in South America and the same for Costa Rica and we have high income countries in the Caribbean. So I'm just asking if there is any relationship with the level of income or development in these countries and the possibility of being selected for the validation or, and case studies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Escobar. Uh, James, if you want to respond to this question. Um, no, the, there is no correlation with uh, income level, at least not, uh, not proposed. So it is a good point though. Um, I think the correlation, the, the, the countries selected um, for the work were, are based on the um, the history of these countries in, in, in prior application and the, the knowledge of these countries and the issues around the essential public health functions. Costa Rica in particular has been, uh, has continued to measure, uh, implement uh, measurements on a somewhat irregular basis, but has continued more than other countries. Chile, we have a specific request coming in from Chile when we met with the, with the health authorities there. Uh, there are other countries. Uruguay has also expressed interest. Um, I think the the interest is really more based on countries that uh, potentially see health from this more holistic perspective. That you know, as as Dr. Land has mentioned, not just from the structuring and organisation of of healthcare delivery through health services, but through health policies that also uh, have impact on on the social determinants of health. Um, and so it's, it's these countries, I think, that are expressing interest. Um, we, we'll have to work with, uh, with Jesse and the team on, uh, to see what countries we'll, we, will, um, we will work with in this initial phase. Obviously, through the processes and uh, that we'll be developing on the strategy and plan of action, all Caribbean countries will be uh, participating in that. But in, in particular application of some of the methodologies, we'll have to, to identify one or two countries in the Caribbean. So. Thanks. Thank you very much, James. I see a message from uh, Dr. Bascolo that uh, the Bahamas has expressed interest in, to participate as a case uh, study country here in the Caribbean. So that, that's interesting to, to read. Thank you, Ernesto. Uh, we have still some few minutes. So we're hoping to finish at uh, 1130. So uh, there's one question here that says, why is this proposal on essential public health functions renewal relevant to the Caribbean? That's to any of the panelists or participants who want to comment on it. Well, I, I will start off and of course I enjoy, I'll invite anyone else to join in. Um, it is relevant because, you know, as I said, there were some successes that I've identified, but the persistent or pervasive concern about how do you address the vulnerabilities, the social determinants of health, the things that affect access you know, for, for varying reasons within the region and the fact that there's still gaps concerning um, health outcomes. I think th there's a need to, to see how it can be done better. I think some of the challenges that COVID um, I allowed us to see in terms of, you know, or, or if you look at the human resource capacity, you know, within health, uh, 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 an organization, an organization, for example, say a, a clinic, one of our ambulatory centers, you may have had 
some of your human resources being, what should I say, redirected to manage COVID. There was messaging to the persons who came to use the clinic. And what's emerging is that there are a number of people who are in perhaps a worse state of health, for example, with respect to their cardiovascular disease management and, and their outcomes because of diversion of resources. So maybe what needs to be considered is how do you strengthen your human resource capacity? And I've been in some discussions where people spoke about, should we be looking at cross training of our healthcare personnel as well, so that people can step up to do certain things um, as the need arises and not create the gaps necessarily, but also maybe even at a, a, a regional level, a CARICOM level, how then do we support each other? Because I mean, we've had, examples locally and in other countries within the region where Cuban nurses, for example, came in to assist. But even for contact tracing, locally here, um, you know, persons who are retired, persons who would have worked in the Ministry of Health, for example, were encouraged to come back. So I think that there are areas that need to be rethought and to be repurposed to address some of the challenges with respect to the, the social, determinants, also the, 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 the governance aspects of it, to have a, a clear mechanism for bringing in volunteers, for expanding the health workforce, for, you know, just finding the areas where we've had some challenges within the last few months, especially with COVID. But again, underlying the, underpinning the, this would be the proper research and development that goes on. We spoke just now about sharing data, but Maybe we need to have a review of how are we collecting data. It's purpose, pur purposively collected for, is for a good reason, but are we collecting it in the same way? Then how do we compare with each other? Because I know sometimes that tends to be the challenge. So maybe identifying specific indicators, specific things that we're all measuring so that we can compare not only for our self-assessment, but across the region. Maybe those are some of the areas that this renewal will help us to to pin down. So where we have fun gaps before, I think those would be areas for us to address. So if I may jump in here. Um, so I, I agree with Heather. Um, I think Heather, in your presentation, you mentioned that there was a lack of confidence in delivery of primary health care services. Um, and so that's one area I'm specifically interested in. Um, we, we say it's, um, we deliver care in Barbados at with, with no cost to the point of, the, of delivery. But it does have a cost because persons have to take a day off work to attend. They may be a maid without any particular um, say in if the employee doesn't want to pay them or give them time off. Um, and we have a system here which we have not been able to change where the primary health care, um, the persons who deliver primary health care it's not necessary to have any postgraduate training. So cross-training of persons might, might be good. Um, training persons with, so they have the, the appropriate skills to deliver this care. And it's overall management of the healthcare system we, we, need, to, we need to improve on. Um, Professor Landis had brought up some good examples of where we influence policy. But I think we still have to we still, that's still an area where we have to make sure that we can influence policy at the university through our research. Because um, I think there's still some gaps where we don't quite uh, influence policy. Some of our research makes a difference right away. Um, I wasn't trying to influence policy in doing a chlamydia prevalence study, but by, by bringing in the PCR testing to the LRU, um, the Professor Landis reference, that was immediately taken up by the Ministry of Health here, and they provided public testing for chlamydia, which was not, which was not being done before. But there are always examples. But you know, ten percent of our budget to Queen Elizabeth Hospital goes into dialysis, um, and um, we really have to make some changes in these social de determinants of health. And I, I was in a meeting with Professor Hassel last night, where he mentioned the commercial de determinants of health. So I thought that's an interesting concept as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adams. I saw Ernesto Bascolo raising his hand. Is that so? No, okay. Well, I think we're getting close to the end, uh, unless there is a, any additional comment or question, but uh, I really thank you very much for your time. I will uh, ask Dr. James Fitzgerald to do the closing remarks. 
Uh, so please, uh, James. Well, thank you very much, Benjamin. And I really wanted to thank um, Peter and, and Heather for their um, inputs and excellent presentations and, and all the participants here for, for, for the discussion. I think it, um, I feel we're on the right direction, I think, listening to you. Um, we, we have received the inputs to continue in the development of this process. And we really look forward to uh, counting on, on your support and your input as this process continues uh, within, the, within the context of, of the needs of the Caribbean. So um, yeah, many thanks on, on our side. And, and as I said, it's going to be a busy year for us all. So uh, we look forward to developing this work problem with you um, throughout the year. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Uh, again, uh, our thanks to all of you for your time and commitment, and uh, we'll continue with this effort, and certainly we'll be in touch uh, very soon. So, uh, thank one, you. one more thing, Chair. Um, uh, is it possible to share the two presentations um, with people who are on the call? I, I found that both were very good. Sure, that's an excellent idea. So I'll be sending the presentations to everyone who participated in the meeting. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.